the average time to eat using mobile games to promote healthy eating. Um, <clears throat> and the goal of the, of the paper for the project we are writing about is to get middle school, <clears throat> American middle school students to eat more healthy. Uh, mainly, they want, um, want their students to start having healthy breakfast, or even breakfast at all. So he has a lot of them didn't actually eat breakfast. Um, and they opened the paper by talking about how there's been a disturbing trend in the last couple of years, of some time, about the obesity-related diseases in children. Uh, and they might not manifest as their children, but when they grow up, go diabetes 2, type 2, uh, and cardiovascular diseases and certain types of cancers have been on the rise. And according to um, Nielsen, they're citing there, um, adolescents and teens uh, on a daily basis spend a lot of time in front of screens, uh, either TV screens, uh, on the computers, or their phone. Um, I, I understand that they probably want to highlight this in a way that, hey, children are taking still a lot of time, and they should be eating lots of fat. But they don't really go more into this, and it doesn't really relate to anything else they're writing in the paper, because they're talking about dieting and not exercise. Uh, so I'm not really sure why they're mentioning it. Um, <clears throat> Background. Yeah. Breakfast is good for uh, not sitting at a computer. For the rest of the yeah, eating habits. Yeah. Um, so they decided that they were going to make a mobile phone game, uh, a mobile phone game to help children eat more healthily. Um, and they chose the mobile phone because it's always with you. Um, it's collecting a lot of data already that can probably be used in some way. Uh, it will tell them stuff like where they are, when they're at. No, no, it's all good. Um, uh, where the student is, uh, can tell them a bit about what they're doing and stuff like that. And they go into all these possibilities about the mobile phone and what it can, do, what kind of data it can collect, or what kind of sensors it has. Uh, but it doesn't really become relevant until the end of the paper when they expand about what they would like to do in the future. Uh, <clears throat> uh, they go on to talk about how the Nintendo Wii has shown that, yes, you can make games that are fun and engaging and still uh, are healthy. It's not just you're sitting on the couch doing stuff. Um, and uh, they're probably referring to the Nintendo Wii Fit and uh, the Nintendo Sports. And although I agree that a lot of these games can help the exercise, a lot of them can also still be played while like sitting in the couch and just waiting a race around. You don't actually have to move your whole body. So uh, they probably have some research on this, but I don't think they link to it. Do I remember correctly? Uh, no. So uh, I would have liked to see the source of that. But, yeah. um, <clears throat> and they talk about how research suggests that people learn more readily uh, when they think they're being observed or they have a feeling of they're being observed, either by someone else or themselves. So, for example, if you're tracking your own weight loss all the time, you might be more engaged in trying to lose weight than if you were just dieting and not tracking your weight for the time. Um, so, they, so they decided that, yeah, we're going to help with the breakfast. We're going to develop this uh, time to eat. And they uh, chose the iPhone, mainly because uh, it's, uh, it was nice and cool at that time. and uh, 
yeah, they wanted the kids to actually like using the device and not have to carry around something that they didn't like. And so they chose the iPhone. Um, that will, it's probably good for this specific uh, paper, although uh, I'm unsure about the usability of the Pictia iPhones, especially some of the iPhones, in that they probably are quite out of date very quickly. Uh, so that's a lot of money <laughs> if you can't do something about the phones later. Um, so you start off, they gave these, um, gave these uh, phones to, I think, 53 uh, middle school students in the class in a rural area. And um, when they started off the game, they could choose uh, some sort of pet companion. So they could choose uh, a worm, a dinosaur, a dog, a hippo, a penguin, a potato head, a robot, a stapler for the tree. And they also got to name this companion. And so they, they wanted to do this, but they wanted the children to have sort of agency in kind of companion they had to so that they would bond to it more easily. And they gave uh, each pet an email account that the children could send emails to uh, in order to communicate with uh, with the pet. I don't know if that email system is built into the app. They don't really specify, but I'm guessing that it is. Um, seeing as Children of that age aren't really that used to using email these days. So I'm guessing that it was probably disguised like some kind of like normal SMS application inside the game, rather than, hey, you have to go to Gmail and send this stuff for this work. Uh, but they don't elaborate on that. Um, and they chose to use email over SMS because actually they first started using SMS. but uh, one of the children sent so many SMS that it would cost a lot of money if they were going to continue that route. So they dropped that and went for email. And so the app of you know, the game more or less is that you, the children, take a picture of the food. That they have. Well, first the in the morning, and you can configure what you mean by morning. Um, the app will send a message from your pet or your companion saying, hey, eat the healthy breakfast. Remember to eat the healthy breakfast in some kind of way. Uh, they have several different uh, messages for this, but it boils down to the same message. Mm -hmm. And so the child goes and hopefully eats a healthy breakfast, and they take a picture of it, and they send it to their pet. And there, it's uh, sent to the researchers, and they evaluate it on its healthiness on a scale from minus 2 to 2. Um, and to be able to do this, they have been trained by some nutritionists. They are, they are not nutritionists themselves, but they've had some training. And so they're probably capable of arranging it on a scale of 5. Um, and what this scale does is that if you go into the negative numbers of minus 1, minus 2, that means you're eating either you're not eating breakfast at all, or you're eating something that's not healthy, like you're eating donuts for breakfast. And what this means is that as you progress through the day, your pet will become unhappy because you haven't had a good breakfast. And so it's kind of like you're sharing your breakfast with your pet, with your virtual pet. And because you're not eating healthily, the pet is not eating healthily. And therefore, that's sad. And you feel bad for that. And now you want to eat more healthy. And on the other side, if you eat healthy, the pet is really happy. And it smiles. And it says something like, yay, today I am feeling awesome. Um, to like, give positive reinforcements to the child. Uh, um, and they they choose they chose to uh, collect data on the breakfast for several reasons. Um, mostly, it was because it happens at home, and so the child has more choice 
you know, they want to eat rather than if they're eating at a school provided lunch like they often do in America. Um, still, it's you have to take into account the fact that they might actually have any help if we have a hand. Uh, you have these kind of horror stories of uh, parents only buying junk food and like going to work before the children go to school, and so they can't actually choose what they want to eat. Um, they don't actually take, uh, they don't comment on this in the paper. I don't know if they've done anything about thinking around this, but maybe they have, maybe they haven't. Um, and they also wanted to choose the breakfast because there are studies that show a lot of American children are skipping breakfast. And this can have adverse effects on how they perform during the school day. Um, and they also comment on how one of the more novel things about the paper is that it took place in the middle school, which isn't really the age group where you normally test these kind of applications. You usually go for younger children or uh, more adults. Uh, mainly because you avoid uh, dealing with a lot of uh, parental consents and um, also like uh, they talk about troubled children that might just want to screw you with your data or just want to sponsor your mobile phone for a month and don't really want to help you at all. Um, <clears throat> and uh, they claim that their study was conclusive and that uh, kids who played time to eat ate a uh, more healthy breakfast and ate the breakfast more fre uh, frequently than those that did. Uh, they don't really talk about how they got in this data or how they can show the data. Um, they're saying that the kids that play time to eat eat more healthily compared to others that don't play the game. They don't say anything about how they got the data for the kids that didn't play the game. Um, if they took it from a different paper or if they had a control group in the same school, uh, they don't say. Uh, which, uh, I, I don't really like that, yeah. because you can't know if there might be socio-economical factors into the picture. And yeah, I was also thinking what would have happened if it was the parents playing the game. Yeah. <laughs> would the study be different, yeah. or would it be identical? Um, and they also talk about how, uh, well, if you're going to do something like this, Keep in mind that you have to have to set up 50 iPhones, <laughs> and that takes quite a while because you need to set up all the permissions so that children don't like just go and uninstall their application, steal their phone, and stuff like that. Um, yeah, so uh, they're saying that children playing the game ate a healthy breakfast 52% of the time. And kids who didn't play the game, they had a big breakfast at uh, 20% of the time. So, again, they don't say where this data is coming from. Uh, fairly obvious where the data like the children that play the game come from, but the other ones, there's still no way. Um, and they found that it was it needed for the kids to get both positive and negative feedback. Uh, so both the, the companion meal to both be happy when they got a good meal and sad when they got a bad one. However, they hadn't specified anywhere in the paper that they had two versions of the versions of the application, one where they test with both positive and negative, and one where they do negative or just positive. Mm -hmm. They hadn't talked about this at all, so it kind of just pops out and say, hey, we know this thing, but yeah. Um, <clears throat> and they found no significant gender differences. 
and they had the same data for uh, for both uh, boys and girls, um, seeing as they had like, 26 of each, probably. Uh, I don't know how specific you can go about that. But. Um, and they also found that the kids were emailing their pet directly, uh, by calling it by the name they've chosen, and interacting in other parts than just the game. So they had well, social emails and not just pictures of food. So, like, hey, how are you doing? I'm doing great. Talk to me. Um, <clears throat> which is uh, which is interesting. It, it, at least it shows that they have suspended their use, even if they don't really interact with the pet and think it's kind of real. At least they have uh, yeah. they have they have some interaction with it, and they actually care about this virtual pet. Um, and so that's their app, and they want to they wanted to. I know, uh, expand it, uh, which opens up a slew of problems. Uh, mainly the fact that if you're going to have 2,000 users, you can't really have researchers sitting and reading every single meal, because uh, it would take forever. And so they, they want to use some sort of automated process for this. Either they want users to rate other users' food, which might be problematic because you're giving health advice and you're not qualified to give health advice. You don't have any kind of training. You can say that donut is healthy. That doesn't mean the donut is healthy. So there are a lot of problems with that. And they also talk about maybe we can do some image recognition. But I don't, I don't really see how that's a good thing either because you can't read. Image recognition isn't good enough for this. You can't tell the difference between a bowl of cereal and a bowl of candy. Most of the time, because cereals have a lot of different colors these days. So that's not a reliable option either. At least not yet. And also this fact about how the kids were getting you know, Having personalized emails that they're sent to the pets, you need some sort of AI to interact with them. And seeing as that's one of the main problems in AI, trying to trick someone into believing you're an actual person and not just a computer. I know they're kids, but still, uh, that I don't see that happening anytime soon either. Um, they also had the problem where they didn't have any sort of automation about uploading data to the server uh, that they actually had so that the, the researchers, when, or actually they say coders in the paper. I don't know if that means researchers or if they've just gotten someone that coded the application to sit down and sit through all this stuff. Um, but they sat down and read all the emails and they graded the food and then they put it up onto the server. Uh, that's not really an efficient way of doing it, I'm guessing. Uh, and no, so all sorts of problems. But that also gave give them some quite a bit of lag. So you, the children don't get instant feedback, which is something you are starting to expect from games these days. Uh, so that's something that will probably need to be hashed out in some way. Um, they're also talking about how uh, great it is that this is a mobile device, and so you can start collecting all sorts of data about these children that you can use for other research, like where they where they are when they eat, uh, what they're eating, in which places. Like if you go to McDonald's, you actually eat a salad, stuff like that. And this opens up a lot of ethical issues. <laughs> Uh, that they don't really talk about, but uh, since it's in future work, we can kind of look away and say, like, yeah, probably talk about that when we get to it. But. Um, 
And they also talk about uh, sharing this data with other researchers, which again opens a lot of issues about that. But uh, so that's uh, that's more or less the paper. And uh, the EOL, yeah, well, they also want to increase, not just talk about uh, healthy diets, but also um, get the children to do their homework and uh, the energy con energy conserving conserving. Yeah. So conserving energy and uh, have a better uh, recycling habits. So they have all of these lofty goals that I think might not be as feasible as they make it sound. And that's more or less the paper. All right. Thank you very much. So I just highlight some of the transcripts. Yeah, so the, 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 they had a transcript interview with a kid. Yeah. So the kid says, I just don't eat breakfasts. And then they ask the kid, well, after playing the game, did it change your uh, way a little, a little, blah, blah, blah. And then they say, yep, I'm eating for the pet. So I, I, I'm eating breakfast. So what will happen if there is no pet, if the game <laughs> stops after the experiment? Will yeah, that kid true. continue eating the breakfast? <laughs> They, they haven't really given him the, the <laughs> right reason to eat breakfast. You should eat for your own health. So it's sort of a to... You should eat for someone else's health. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, well, that too looks a bit. And they also have this other transcript, uh, a bit further down, I think, where it's obvious that uh, <laughs> Kate is <laughs> both, yeah, that's, but not the game. That yeah, is true. Good <laughs> sad, <laughs> Yeah, that one here. Indeed. So there were some flaws in the in the study. The, the it was more like a game out of those three oh, yeah. papers. That was definitely a game. Uh, mo the most game-like game out of those three systems. Uh, but as part of the research, uh, it had some flaws of how things were done and how inferences were made. Uh, and I I don't know whether the whole point of gamifying eating is a good idea. I I have my doubts about it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Especially because they don't actually have, have any kind of uh, they don't talk about portion sizes in any way. You can eat as healthy as you want. <laughs> if you eat two kilos of food for breakfast, that's not a good thing. <laughs> um, and they also don't have any sort of consideration for different dietary needs, different children. Yeah. Uh, some might have don't start a medical condition, that means they have to eat more or less than what's recommended. Hey, you're having surgery in the morning. Oh, but my kid is going to be sad. <laughs> but you can't eat for 24 hours. But it must be sad. And uh, I don't know how much you should condition children to listen to their thoughts about what they yeah. do. But also they've chosen for the study, they've chosen the home environment where it's more controlled and more sort of the morning routine kind of thing. Yeah. Not the out in the wild children making decisions of what they eat sort of thing. Yeah. And at home I would feel it's mostly for those kids, mostly parents dictating the, the patterns of behavior. Yeah. But they didn't explain like the proportions, the, the social economics uh, of the groups. Yeah. So I think they they might actually have a lot of this data, but they don't tell us about it, so we don't know. Mm. They they also don't do a good job of uh, the really like like how you teach <laughs> in the game. No. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> because why can't I just take a photograph? Of well, we can't hear you, Simon. Roll it round. Oh. We cannot hear you. Okay. Ah. Um, he no, he's not muted. We can't hear him. Integrated. Can you hear me now? Still not. Uh, no, that's that. No. Still not. What about? <laughs> no, we can't hear you. Oh. You, we can hear you very, very quietly. Oh, you can hear me very, very quietly. I'll get closer to you. Uh, well, barely. Oh, yeah, I was almost nothing. Almost nothing. Okay. Um, 
Microphone. Can you change the microphone? I'm just trying to change the microphone. Uh, yeah, there you are. <laughs> we can hear you now. They don't do a good, a good job <laughs> because as a teacher, what you do is you take a photograph and then you roll your plate around and you take another photograph. You take you roll your plate around and take another photograph. Take roll your plate around and take another photograph, and you just do that for like the, on the Monday. And then on Tuesday you give them the second photograph, on Wednesday you give them the third photograph, on Thursday you give them the fourth photograph. Because you know you don't have to have taken the photograph with like today's newspaper in the background or something. Right? It just says you know send a photograph yeah. of what you were having that morning. So, indeed, indeed. By you know, a timestamp in the and you check the timestamp. <laughs> Yeah, but you can still take an image of an image, so you can't. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but I don't think the children are going to be smart enough to do that unless you tell them that, hey, we know you took the same picture as last night. Because the game mechanic was you have to feed a picture of healthy food for yeah. the pet to feel better. That's the mechanic. It. You don't even have to eat it. Yeah. Yeah. You just have to eat in the morning. You have to photograph an apple, you know? Yeah. <laughs> or maybe you know you, uh, yeah. you post a picture of some uh, cereal and some fruit, and you avoid it taking a picture of the chocolate you <laughs> were eating afterwards. Yeah, so you take a picture of your sister's food. <laughs> you just go to so there were the yeah some issues there. <laughs> yeah. well, I I actually I have to say I really like this paper. Uh, <laughs> I, I didn't like it last year as well because it it. it Clearly shows that this field is very immature. Yeah. That they accept this into a journal. <laughs> yes. I know. Tells you a lot about how immature this field is. <laughs> Indeed. Yeah. Yeah. Because it has all these flaws. Yeah. And, and, and still it, gets in. Still gets in. It's very well formatted. It's very well presented paper, yeah, right? Nice but that's right. That. But the content is definitely unacceptable. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, it is interesting. Yeah, and it definitely felt more more like a game yeah, than the other. It raises some of the ethical issues that are important to keep in mind. Mm. Um, internal versus external motivations. Uh, lots of lots of issues to, to discuss. It, it's it's good as a model or not to have to do it. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So we did have some questions from students, including Hannah now. <laughs> uh, time to eat. Oh, you didn't get any points. Look at that. <laughs> um, so, yeah, the screen is a little bit too small. So let me check. I will share it because I can do one screen sharing per session. <laughs> Be able to screen, uh, share share the next screen. If I do what? If I if you end the screen sharing before you close the window. Okay. I'm thinking All right. maybe can. We may yeah, try. Yeah, maybe the screen sharing is technically still going on in the yeah. background. And it's automatically stopped. Uh, that would uh, be a good thing. Yeah. But then again, Google Plus has had its issues. Right. So that was quite highly ranked and that one and that one I I added four to that one because I, I felt that was an in, in important question uh, which psychological aspects should be considered during developing food games for children so from the literature I've read about children and eating because as a parent you have have to do that uh, they strongly suggest not gamifying food eating habits. So don't giving rewards, don't giving punishments, don't gamifying the, the patterns, just making the patterns stick. So slowly sort of trying to make that stick, uh, to, ma to make it intrinsically, not extrinsically motivated. Uh, and, and parents being present <laughs> showing uh, habits. Exactly, that you have to show that you eat it and you like it and you sort of be consistent and um, and I don't know, I'm not an expert in the field, but this study didn't address any of those questions. Um, well, doing all those things, it's easy to see how some people could easily develop like a weird relationship to food when 
That's right. With all these values. It may have adverse effects to what you intended. Um, yeah, so... Yeah. So second question also, uh, Johannes kind of mentioned some technical difficulties. Three iPhones were lost. Uh, people get attached to iPhones. Sorry? Two, two yeah. Um, and there is, um, yeah. Also the fact that you give them something, and when the stuff is over, take it away, what is then the long-term effect? Exactly, and they haven't measured that neither. So they haven't measured what happened after the experiment finished. Uh, I think they said they wanted to. <laughs> um, so we, we tried to look for the updated paper, but we couldn't find it. <laughs> that there, where they did the the um, the, the post um, intervention survey. Um, oh, yeah. yeah, that's not seen to be published anywhere. <laughs> okay. They didn't like the results. Maybe, <laughs> maybe they had negative results. To be crude, who's done this PhD? The PhD is out there working. So the question for. Uh, the authors of the paper suggest several features to increase the longevity and effectiveness of the game. What are those features? Who asked that question? Uh, they wanted to give it more kind of game features, mm -hmm. where you could, for example, you could play fetch with uh, your pet, or you could uh, give, it, give it a ball or stuff like that. Try interacting with it more than just the base game. But the kids would still be interested in the pet after mm -hmm. like two months of eating it. Um, which uh, it, it might work. Uh, it might also not work. Yeah. Uh, th there is a specific kind of person person that likes these kind of games. It's not for everyone. So it might work for some people and not for others. Yeah. Also, the, the virtual pets is sort of a genre which is interesting on its own right. Like, yeah. what effect does it have on on people in general? Uh, Give us money over virtual pony. Exactly. <laughs> and they haven't discussed that aspect neither. Uh, they just made an arbitrary I'm choice also of. How you're going to play pets with a tree? <laughs> 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 I'm having seen Harry Potter. <laughs> the trees never fly. <laughs> and usually, no people watch them either. <laughs> Uh, and one of the interesting questions would be, um, are people who are attracted to looking mm -hmm. after virtual pets the same as the people who are having eating problems? Because it could be that those two things don't overlap, right? The kind of people yes. who are really interested in looking after virtual pets and want to take care of them and are really good at taking care of them may not be the people who have eating problems. So, <laughs> There may be a mismatch in, in the kind of people who enjoy playing your game and the kind of people who should play your game. That's right. Absolutely. Very good point. OK, so thank you very much. Um, there was one question uh, related to, um, to voting on questions. And do you feel the current voting system is fine? Like that you have to distribute a fixed amount of values, fixed amount of points across the questions? Or didn't, or you didn't like it? I think it's probably fine. But it's a problem when you don't actually get to your questions. <laughs> well, yeah, g given that, yeah, I don't make mistakes. Uh, because there are other alternative ways of, of grading questions. Uh, but this particular one feels like you try to identify, and of course you can give zero as well, right? You can get give all eight points to one paper or one question. Uh, that it promotes you to making kind of conscious decision of what the questions standing out are. Yeah. And then the rest and is, how much they, are they stand out. The others, yeah. Than just eight or arrange them from best to worst. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So then you get, don't get the scale between. That's right. And also, as opposed to grading them to some artificial imaginary ideal, because yeah. we could grade questions from one to four, each of them, uh, but then you can't, it, you, it's difficult to compare them. Yeah. Whereas with this me method, it's easier to sort of compare the, the, the questions. Uh, 
Yeah. Right, so we will we will do that. Um, those people who didn't vote, and you can revise your votes because Hannah's questions were not in. Please uh, revise your your voting, um, and I will post here the answers. So uh, each of you, so some of you already emailed me um, two answers for the for some of the questions. So I will post them here, and then uh, we can vote on those as well using. Uh, the, the rules described up up in front of um, you did mean two answers or you, that we pick two questions for each paper yeah for answer, that's right yeah mm -hmm. yeah yeah so it's per pa per per paper so two answers per paper yeah correct yeah. I think it's a two answers in total yes I think that's enough two answers in total Across all three papers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Either okay. one. I know. I, I, yeah, that sounds fine to me. What I mean, it's up to up to us to decide. Yeah, I I thought two per paper, but maybe that's too much. Yeah, maybe that's too much work. Uh, maybe, well, maybe say okay. maybe just drop the number two and say one per paper. So you have three questions in total, which is that's... more than two, and you actually cover all the papers. <laughs> We so could do that. Yeah. So we get points for the answers if they get votes. What happens if we add more answers then? Yeah. So you have to email me which one I you should post. Mm -hmm. So if if those of you who answer two questions for each paper, just select one, and that's the one we will gonna use. Makes makes it fair. Yeah. I mean the the rules of the game are not. Set in stone. We sort of working out what will work, uh, work out here. Mm -hmm. So I'm I'm happy with yeah either alternative. Yeah, but I think is, yeah this is the is. active playtesting phase. <laughs> yeah. Because it's very easy to make questions for a paper without actually reading it. But if you're going to answer a question, then you actually kind of need to read the paper uh, in its full length. Makes and sense. So, and so having a question for each paper would probably be better. Because I can honestly say that one of the uh, for the last lecture, one of the questions I submitted, I hadn't actually read the paper yet. I read it later, but I was able to so ask a question. Uh, question and actually got the top. Uh, <laughs> 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 so which question was that? Uh, I think it was if you go uh, oh, sorry, I lost, uh, yeah. Okay. yeah. Or you comment on how it was a good one, a good question for the. Um, yeah, uh, the first one on the first paper, you could ask well, so how did the author use the papers into it. Oh, yeah. yeah. The methodology. And you commented on how that was a good question. Sorry, I think maybe to respond to how that was a good question. And I hadn't actually read the paper. Except I had read the first paragraph, kind of, and just figured out, oh, okay, they did this. Yeah, that was early on, sort of the yeah yeah. All right, so let's stick to one answer per paper. Um, yeah, sounds good. So for next week, we have games for science. Um, we need two volunteers to do the two articles, and then I will do the third. I will yeah talk a, a little bit about it as well. So the third one is not posted yet, yeah. but we need two volunteers for these two. Could do the second one. You would like to do the second one? Yeah. All right. I don't really want to volunteer, Christian, especially since he hasn't really been able to attend the most of the lectures. But he did cross his rewrite his but, but I was, on uh, I, was, I, was, I, was, I talked to Henry last week, and I was saying he might be chosen for next time, and he said that was okay. So, yeah. have so I can pencil him in. So I can. Okay. Yeah. So let's do that. I think it's Did I spell your name right, Hannah? Yeah. Perfect. All right. So let's let's do that. Okay. Any final comments, Simon? 
myself. I'll unmute myself. Um, no, I know. I think um, I know. I'm currently reviewing papers for Games Health, and we'll have uh, there will be another Games Health um, uh, conference, which will be game papers. So one of the things I'll, I'd like to do um, later in the course is get you guys to have a look at some of the um, pre-prints, i.e., the, the ones that we review as um, uh, conference reviewers and journal reviewers. Um, because, yeah, and as, as Rena says, this is a young field, and so you can still get some published stuff which isn't that highly um, yes, thought of. But, um, yeah, I know it's, it's important to get a feeling for for the way the area is evolving. Um, the Horizon 2020 has a whole section on gamification series games. So there's the European funding is for the next um, four or five years, there's going to be a, a constant applications for games um, and Games for Health is considered one of the really, really big ones. So um, if, if you're interested in Games for Health, there's a growing industry, there's a growing market, there are more and more people doing research and, and more industries working in this area. So um, yeah, it's, it's going to be an interesting area. Okay. Yep. All right. Thank you.